In the previous video, we finished the story of Menki. If you haven't watched it yet, please click the link to enjoy it. Next, we're going to tell the story of Gaiak. Exciting content is about to unfold, so stay tuned. One day in 1206, as twilight enveloped Earth, a cry of new life emerged from Gegadai's tent. This was his first son, whom they named Gaiak, meaning running or sprinting in their language. They hoped this name would imbue the child with endless vitality and unyielding spirit, like a horse galloping across the vast plains, fearless of wind and rain. Boldly pushing forward, in 1229, Vrth was shrouded in silence, broken only by the sharp sound of sword light cutting through the air at this moment. Gaik was carrying out his father's orders, donned in armor. Daring his father's expectations, he participated in the war against the Jin dynasty for the first time. He was like a lion in the wind, plunging into the sea of grass. Fearlessly advancing, his sword was like lightning, swift and sharp. Slicing through sturdy armor and piercing enemy flesh, his eyes, like those of a hawk, were sharp and firm, fearless. Every one of his charges, like a whirlwind in a storm, struck fear in the hearts of his enemies. They witnessed the courage and fiery determination of this young warrior. Their bravery shattered instantly before Gaik's powerful presence. In his first battle, he exhibited extraordinary courage and strategic vision. Every step he took, every swing of his sword on the battlefield contributed to his illustrious military achievements. In the autumn of 1235, within the opulent confines of Gagedai Khan's tent, the atmosphere of the feast was lively and tense. This was a meeting of the kings, under the witness of many mighty figures. Gaged Icon decided to wage war against the yet unsubmitted Kipchaks and Russia. He selected Joki's second son Bachir as the commander to lead the expedition. Gaik, Gigadai's eldest son, joined them on this campaign. It was a challenging journey. With Gaik and his cousin Menki fighting together, they engaged in a fierce battle in the Caucasus region. The fiery spirit of the two young generals illuminated the dark battlefield they demonstrated astonishing courage and cunning in war, striking fear into the heart of their enemies. The valor of Gaik and the wisdom of Menki formed a formidable force, bringing victory after victory for the Mongol Empire. Their reputation followed the trail of the army, spreading to Central Europe, letting the world know the might of these two young commanders. In the winter of 1240, in the northern palace of the Mongol Empire, Goged Icon was gravely ill. He knew he might not win this battle against the Grim Reaper. He commanded his messenger to deliver a decree to his eldest son Gaik, who was far away on the battlefront in Central Europe, in the expeditionary army's tent. When the messenger arrived with the decree, a flash of surprise and anxiety was visible in Gaik's eyes. He unfurled the decree, his gaze serious as he read the intricate Mongolian script. The message told him that his father, Gagedai, was critically ill and commanded him and others to return to the court. The gravely ill father and the unfinished battle. Both filled Gaik's heart with struggle at that moment, however. The imperial order couldn't be disobeyed, he organized his troops, preparing for the long journey back to Mongolia. In the winter of 1241, Gagedai Khan passed away at home. This news spread across the entire empire like the wind, yet Gaik still on the difficult return journey from the western battlefield, had not yet received the devastating news. Back in distant Mongolia, Gegadai's widow Queen Tregi, fully aware of the seriousness of the situation, immediately summoned Chancellor Yelu Chikai, hoping to discuss the matter of choosing the new Khan with him. Inside the palace, Queen Tregi and Yelu Chikai discussed Gaik, Gegadai's eldest son. However, during Gegadai's reign, he did not show much favor to his eldest son Daik, his affection always lay with his third son, Kochu. Unfortunately, Kochu died in the Mongol invasion of the Song dynasty in 1236 and was unable to inherit the empire. Afterwards, Gogedai planned to let Kochu's eldest son, Shiraman, inherit the throne. Queen Tregin and Chancellor Yelu Chukai sat in the spacious court hall, facing each other, their hearts filled with uncertainty and unease, looking at Yelu Chukai. Queen Tregin's eyes were filled with determination and resolve, she said. 
When the former emperor was alive, he intended for the Prince Shiraman to succeed. However, the prince is still a child and the eldest son, Gaik, is away on a western expedition. What do you think we should do now? Her words were filled with expectation, hoping for the best answer from Yelud Shikai. Upon hearing this, Yelud Shikai thought for a moment before seriously responding. Since the former emperor had such intentions, we should immediately let the crown prince ascend the throne. However, Queen Tregin did not agree with this answer. She fell silent for a while, just when the silence became awkward. Her confidant Ochigin suddenly spoke out. Since the prince is still young and Hildost's son hasn't returned, why not invite the queen mother to take charge? His words instantly made the atmosphere in the hall tense. Yeluchikai hastily said. This matter requires careful consideration, however. Queen Torajin was already smiling, saying. There's no harm in holding temporary rule. Yeluchikai wanted to say something else. But upon seeing Order Komen glaring at him, he swallowed his words. The grand hall of the palace fell eerily silent as everyone awaited the approaching shift in power. In these days of turbulent changes, Queen Tora Jean's interim rule undoubtedly became the precursor to the Empire's political storm. She sat on the throne, issuing commands to her courtiers with no bias. However, this rule was merely a delaying tactic to placate the populace. Chancellor Yelu Chikai was dissatisfied with this decision and chose to retreat under the guise of ill health. He no longer participated in state affairs, no longer shared worries for the wavering empire to him. Queen Torajin's actions were nothing but a reckless power grab, and he chose to keep his distance. Yet, the power struggle did not cease. During the Connect's vacancy, Temuj Ochigin, one of the Eastern kings, rode with his brave troops towards the capital, Karakoram. His singular goal was to seize the Connect to become the new ruler of the Mongol Empire. Temuj's plans were foiled by the swift actions of Gaik, a prince always stationed in the western region upon receiving news of his father's death. Gaik immediately led his troops across the steppe to the region of Yimai, without stopping. He drove his warhorse directly towards the capital, Karakoram. This maneuver left Temuj helpless, watching as Gaik steadily approached the capital and the Khanate. The power struggle continued. But the outcome of this war was already decided amidst the confusion. The five years of Queen Tora Jean's rule flowed by like a turbulent river on the throne. She consistently displayed a mother's resilience and a queen's dignity, generously rewarding the royal family and ministers to ensure their support and loyalty to her son Gaik's smooth ascension to the Khanate. However, the regulations laid down by Genghis Khan himself presented an insurmountable chasm before Queen Torajin and her son Gaik. The successor of the Great Khan had to be elected at a Kuraltai, attended by leaders of all Mongol tribes before officially taking the Khanate. Queen Torajin knew that this was a battle she must win. Amidst the rules of ceremony and scheming of power, she planned, strategized, and waited. Days turned into years until August 26, 1246, when she announced the convening of the Kuraltai the resilience and wisdom of the queen, as well as the fate of Gaik and his mother, would be determined at this grand assembly. When the Purple Dawn quietly arrived, and the winds of change were once again gathering in the Mongol Empire, the great assembly that would shape the future was about to begin. On the eve of the assembly, the Empress Tregin issued a call to all the princes and nobles across the lands, ordering them to gather in the capital city, Karakora, to participate in this grand event of destiny. However, the power struggles within the Mongol Empire were always full of twists and turns. That, a general who had once led a successful expeditionary force and earned great prestige, had a far-reaching reputation. But when he heard that Gaik was to be elected as the Khan during the assembly, he was filled with discontent. His relationship with Gaik was not harmonious, and their conflicts had a long history. He was full of objections to the idea of Gaik becoming the Khan. As a result, he feigned ill health and chose to abstain from the assembly. Although he could not attend personally, he chose to send his younger brother, Belk, in his place, indicating his attention towards the assembly and demonstrating his influence to the Empress. On August 26, 
The sun's effusive rays poured over Karakora, lifting the curtain on this defining meeting. Princes from the eastern and western roads, ministers and generals from all over had gathered in Karakora, waiting for the Empress Tregging to start the assembly in the nearby summer camp, Dalan Dalan. Empress Tregging, a woman who always managed to control the situation, had co-opted the princes and ministers who were attending the meeting in advance, and as a result, the assembly unanimously elected Gaik as the Khan. However, Gaik pretended to be frail and ill and declined several times, but the princes and ministers repeatedly persuaded him. After some manoeuvring, Gaik finally agreed to accept the position of Khan, but he made one request, only if he was elected Khan. The position must be passed down to his descendants. Thereupon the attendees swore, as long as there is a single member of your family alive, even if he is wrapped in oil and grass, we will never give the Khanate to anyone else. Hearing such an oath, Gaik was overjoyed. He felt his goal was within reach amid the expectations and praises of the people. The 41-year-old Gaik ascended to the throne. After Gaik's ascension, Empress Tregging continued to wield the royal scepter, deeply interfering in state affairs. A few months later, upon the Empress Tregging's death, Gaik was finally able to rule in his own right, beginning to infuse his ideas into the powerful empire. During his reign, Gaik maintained contact with the distant Pope in Rome. Rumors in Europe suggested that the great Khan of the Mongols was a Christian, which presented an opportunity to Pope Innocent IV, so he sent Giovanni Carpini on a mission to Mongolia. The Pope's expectations for Carpini were clear. He hoped that Carpini could persuade the great Khan not to harm those who also believed in Christianity, while also seeking a deeper understanding of Mongol customs and ways of war, to pave the way for future negotiations. Carpini, bearing the Pope's expectations and instructions, embarked on this long journey in the end. He was unable to convince Gaik to convert to Catholicism. After receiving a response from Gaik, he began his journey back west, passing through the lower Volga River and Botu's encampment, and through Kiev to return to the west. In the spring of 1247, Gaik's brother, Godin, who was titled as the King of Ziliang, was receiving a visitor from afar in Liangzhou. He was Sakya Pandita Kungagayaltsan, the religious leader of the Tibetan tribes. The purpose of this meeting was to negotiate the terms of Tibet's submission to the Mongol Empire. They sat in the residence in Liangzhou, conversing face to face. Kungagayaltsan's face held a hint of worry and anticipation, knowing that this meeting would determine Tibet's future. In front of him, King Kodan of Ziliang was calm, his eyes exuding resolve and wisdom. Kunga Gyaltsen listed the conditions for Tibet's submission one by one. First, to present tribute, showing their loyalty. Then to pay tribute, followed by accepting the administration of Mongol officials. And finally, the land of Tibet would be incorporated under the rule of the Mongol Empire. Their conversation was serious and rhythmic, which was somewhat oppressive. Sakya Pandita Kunga Gyaltsen held the teacup in his hand his heart torn, but he knew that this was their best choice. He needed to make this decision for the prosperity and peace of Tibet. In front of him, King Kodan of Ziliang nodded in agreement, and their meeting reached a consensus, historically known as the Alliance of Liangzhou. Gaik ascended to the throne of the Great Khan, ruling over the vast Mongol Empire, but what he inherited was not just power and glory, but also a chaotic and corrupt dynasty. Under the rule of his mother, Empress Tregging. The court's legal system had deteriorated and the government was in chaos. The situation was like a trapped beast fight, filled with intricate conflicts and dilemmas. However, Gaik did not immediately set about rectifying the government, instead, to repay the princes, ministers and generals who had elected him as the Great Khan. He opened the national treasury and generously rewarded them with gold and treasures. He acted like an insatiable devourer spending lavishly to show his generosity and gratitude. However, his body was not as resilient as his ambition. He was physically weak, and his limbs often convulsed due to illness nevertheless. He followed his father's footsteps, 
immersing himself deeply in the bochu as if it was his only way to relieve his immense pressure. Therefore, under Gaik's rule, the chaos and decay left by his mother only worsened. The once united laws became more divided. The centrifugal phenomenon became more evident and the decline, like a spreading epidemic, grew worse day by day. The entire Khanate was like a ship in a storm, teetering on the brink of collapse. In the autumn of 1247, the wind was gentle, and the cold gradually enveloped the land. Mongol Kongaik was planning an operation called the Western Tour in the palace. This was not a normal inspection, but a grand Western expedition, with his sights set on Batu. Batu's name was like a thorn in Gaik's heart, painful and angry. When he was elected Khan, Batu failed to attend the meeting due to illness, which filled Gaik with resentment. He harbored resentment and injustice towards this Western commander and decided to wage war against this brother who challenged his authority. The palace lights flickered and Gaik's eyes were determined and cold. His finger tapped on Batu's position on the strategic map. He knew this would be a tense and challenging battle, but he had no intention of backing down. Instead, he looked forward to knocking down this thorn in his side. Are we ready? Gaik asked the general beside him in a deep voice. We can leave at any time. Con. The general replied, his voice firm and resounding. Gaik nodded, took a deep breath and sighed in relief. He looked out the window at the deep night sky. The moonlight was like silver. Shining on his determined face, he murmured, the journey begins now. In the spring of 1248, on the plains outside Karakoram, Mongol Kongaik, dressed in armor, led his army and began his journey west in the spring breeze. Flags fluttered, cavalry loomed like clouds, creating a majestic scene. By March, as the army reached Hanxiong Yidi, the spring sun failed to illuminate the sorrow on Gaik's face. The health of the frequently sick Khan suddenly worsened. His face was as pale as paper. He was physically exhausted. And the pain of his illness made him shiver. However, his eyes were still firm. As if he was fighting against his disease, his generals and guards hurried over. They looked worriedly at their Khan, helplessly watching him struggle in pain. They found that their once determined and energetic Khan had become so weak, which filled their hearts with despair and reluctance. Gaik endured the pain, gripping his precious sword. Looking at the western horizon, his eyes sparkled with determination and unyielding spirit. However, the attack of the disease made him unable to fight any more soon. On this land of the Mongolian steppe, he closed his eyes forever, his life ended at the age of 43. Gaik, a ruler beset by fate but unyielding, he ascended to the throne under the protection of his mother Tregi. But his reign did not meet expectations by inheriting and carrying forward his mother's political wisdom. His rule was filled with controversy and complexity. But revenge had blinded his eyes, regardless of the consequences. And he finally ended his short life on the journey of conquest in the next video. We're going to share the story of Tolui's eldest son, Menki. Please look forward to the content of the next episode. If you like this story, please help us by subscribing and sharing. Thank you.